Hey, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to try. It's always difficult to talk right after lunch. I'm going to try not to put you guys to sleep. Um, there's a little bit of like technical stuff that I'm going to talk about, but I'll try and keep it as interesting as possible. But all right, so my name is Sajjad. I work at Mapbox. Um, I've, been, I've been doing OpenStreetMap stuff for several years now. Uh, most, of my, most of my work's been around helping other people use OpenStreetMap data, but not limited to the data, also the software that helps OpenStreetMap run. Um, so when I talk about how we can use the OpenStreetMap software for more than uh, what we do at OpenStreetMap, uh, there are potentially quite a, some challenges that we have to tackle. Uh, I'm going to introduce some of those uh, things that I came across in a couple of my projects and some of, some of my ideas how we can try and solve this. Uh, it might sound very ambitious, uh, but we're going to try anyway. So yeah, so OpenStreetMap is sort of one of the largest projects out there right now, which is kind of crowdsourcing spatial data. Um, I like to think of OpenStreetMap as insanely successful, uh, with over 2.1 million people editing the map. Um, and we've been around for over 10 years, right? And this does speak quite a bit about the things that we have learned over 10 years. It's not necessarily how mature the software is or how mature the data is, but it's about the lessons that we have learned in actually making the software work for crowdsourcing and supporting uh, 2.1 million users. Um, so there are a lot of people actually look into, when they, when they go out hunting for software, open source software that works uh, to do spatial data management, they do spend quite a bit of time in terms of the lessons that the other software has learned and how that has improved. Some of the features which is kind of attractive to a lot of people and why people use OpenStreetMap software, um, I can't think of any other platform um, or software that does spatial data collaboration as well as OpenStreetMap. If you know one, I'll be happy to talk to you about that. Uh, the whole idea of chain sets and nodes, discussion, uh, revision, and stuff like that does not exist anywhere else. And this is, this is pretty interesting for people who are looking to manage large spatial data sets. Um, I do talk to a lot of people about the way we store data in OpenStreetMap. There are a lot of arguments about why this is not ideal. But I do, personally, I think this is one of the best ways to actually store spatial data uh, without having to worry much about uh, the database schema and stuff, so people could actually just add whatever data that they want without worrying about um, what's going behind in the database. It's cross-platform, right? We, all of us are on different platforms. We all have Linux, Windows, OS X. We do have stuff on mobile phones, which is sort of kind of still working, but work in progress. And it's all open source, which is kind of why people think uh, it's a great idea to invest and use OpenStreetMap software. I always kind of think the OpenStreetMap software as not just like independent pieces of software, but a larger ecosystem, right? So we have stuff from like the editors like Jossum ID with rendering technology, which is kind of proven to be successful, called Mapnik with, with like the Rails API that kind of supports all the data I.O. Uh, we have the tasking manager, which is kind of built around the hot needs, but still works uh, for other use cases, too. Um, we sort of kind of have a pretty interesting stack of software to manage spatial data, from collecting to validation to you know publishing and feedback, right? Um, and so this is sort of like the whole spatial data management ecosystem why, and why people are interested in using it. There are a lot of people using uh, OpenStreetMap software, at least bits of it. Uh, so I recently found out that the Indian Space Research Organization uh, 
uses OpenStreetMap. And I live in Bangalore, where we're kind of setting up um, a data team for Mapbox to sort of work closely with OpenStreetMap data. And part of the thing that I do in India is to be very closely involved with the open data community. And we've been talking to a lot of government agencies to actually open up data. And the Space Research Organization is perhaps one of the most bureaucratic organizations that exist in the country uh, because they always have the excuse that, okay, all our stuff is built using defense contracts and defense funding, so it has a very, like, sort of a security reason to it. Um, and it was kind of mind-blowing to see how they were using the ID editor to um, trace stuff off their satellite imagery. Um, we started talking to them about how we can open the satellite imagery to be to edit within OpenStreetMap, uh, so that's work in progress. Most of my experience and the stuff that I'm going to talk about is during what I com came across during my time uh, at working with this bunch of people based out of DC and Congo on a project called Moabi, uh, where we kind of ripped off OpenStreetMap, everything. Like, we took the Rails API, we took the rendering stack, we took planet dumps, we took replication, everything, to actually set up a custom clone of OpenStreetMap to manage uh, natural resource extraction data uh, in, in the DRC. Um, so yeah, so we kind of ripped off the whole thing, added our own layers and logo and stuff like that. Uh, it was pretty interesting. Uh, we've seen the National Park Service use OpenStreetMap. Uh, they have a custom instance of ID with their own presets. Um, I recently found out that an organization called Digital Democracy, they've been working on uh, making ID work offline. Uh, which I think is pretty interesting because they work a lot in, in the Amazon where internet connectivity is still questionable. So they've been working on a custom instance of ID that works offline, which is exciting. Um, right after me, Olaf from Development Seed is going to talk about the work they did with the government of the Philippines where they started using OpenStreetMap infrastructure to uh, map road networks in the country. Um, I'm, I'm sure Olaf's going to talk about more of the challenges that they faced. Um, recently, New York City published uh, building footprints for the whole city, and we imported that into OpenStreetMap. One of the things that they use, uh, they take out of OpenStreetMap is uh, something like this. This is an email that goes out to a bunch of people when building footprints change in OpenStreetMap in New York City. Um, so, they don't necessarily use a custom instance of OpenStreetMap, but I thought this is interesting because there are several entry points to the whole ecosystem of software that we have uh, behind OpenStreetMap. So the thing that I wanted to talk is that um, there have been a lot of questions whether this is interesting, whether we should actually think of developing the software in a way that other people can start using it immediately. Um, and my response to a lot of those questions is essentially that since a lot of people are using OpenStreetMap, this kind of presents a huge opportunity for us to improve our software, uh, but also take back a lot of the stuff that other people have learned into OpenStreetMap. I've been following this email thread uh, on the humanitarian OpenStreetMap mailing list uh, about customizing ID. Um, and so James, who's also sitting here, they, so the question is about new people editing, uh, jumping right into our task, which is, uh, on, which is live on Tasking Manager, but the tagging scheme is kind of messed up because people don't necessarily look the documentation. So the suggestion was, can we use a custom instance of ID and restrict the presets to particular tasks, right? And this is something that people have done before, uh, customizing presets, and I personally have worked on ID doing some of that stuff. Um, so this is clearly something that we've learned from people doing stuff outside of the OpenStreetMap uh, system. Um, at Moabi, we, two years ago, we forked off of something that sort of existed in OpenStreetMap. So if you go to the OpenStreetMap GitHub repository, there's a branch called Group Sketch. So 
there's been a discussion of adding groups into OpenStreetMap so that people could have you know, discussion around particular topics, particular areas, and presets and stuff like that. Um, it was, we forked off at that point and start, sort of built the whole thing into the Moabi clone of our uh, system. Uh, Tim Waters, who's gonna also speak at some point later today, did most of the work uh, on the groups front. Um, one thing that kind of hurts me while I work with the OpenStreetMap software when helping other people to kind of start using it is the assumptions that we've made when we write the software. And like part of me thinks that it's totally fine uh, because we sort of imagined OpenStreetMap to just stay within OpenStreetMap, the software. Um, and but we're kind of losing out on a lot of opportunity to actually learn more about uh, other people using the software. Um, one of the things that I was working on was to actually making ID editor edit large objects. So if you, uh, by default, the OpenStreetMap ID editor, if you go to openstreetmap.org slash edit, you can start editing only after zoom level 16. Oh yeah, sorry. Is it better? Awesome. Um, so the, the OpenStreetMap default ID editor right now, you can only edit if you go beyond zoom level 16, right? Now this, this is sort of, diff it, it becomes very difficult for you to edit large polygons. Um, and there's a very, very strong performance reason why this is restricted to 16. Um, and we started looking at how we can make this happen uh, to actually start editing large polygons. Uh, it was exceptionally difficult because of the assumptions that we've made uh, while we write the software. Um, it's sort of still halfway there. Uh, we're gonna merge it at some point. Uh, and Brian Housel sitting here has also been helping me do this quite a bit. Um, one of the things that we did with ID to sort of break away from the assumption is that uh, there are a lot of people using ID who wants to use custom presets, their own presets. For instance, National Park Service uses their own presets. At Moabi, we use our own presets. Uh, so the largest pain point was you could kind of hack in your own presets, but you would be alone after that because you won't be able to merge in changes without a lot of yak shave. Um, so we made that happen. Now you can do custom presets uh, and custom imagery. You could have a list of like presets a JSON, which you can serve from anywhere, or a static file. Um, we built something called the preset editor because not, not a lot of people kind of know how to write JSON. It's still something that's difficult for a lot of people who work in the fields who are not familiar with computers. Uh, it's sort of this simple like thing, single page app, which helps you add a preset. Um, so yeah, if you're using custom presets, go ahead and use this. So I thought I'd take a minute to actually talk about uh, how complex the system is. So most people just want this, right? There's some data, they just want a tile server, and then want to serve some beautiful maps. It's not that easy. Um, there are a ton of moving parts. And this is, if you think this is all, uh, it's still not all of it. So this is just the, the tile server bit. Um, and the editing and the editors and the API and stuff that's staying outside of it. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting. This is a very complex problem that we've been solving here, uh, is actually collaboratively editing large amount of spatial data. And it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Um, one of the things that we could improve uh, is documentation. And uh, while I was setting up custom instances of OpenStreetMap, I had to go through at least like a dozen of wiki pages to actually put it together. And it w it, it's not ideal, and some of, those some of those wikis are not even updated. So that kind of brings me to a lot of other issues, like you know, some packages are meant to be, so this is, this is from my own documentation that I wrote for like my own notes, was that well, we tried to use the, the BBA, but it was supposed to look for Mapnik 2.2, 2 .2, but it was looking for 2.1, uh, and then we ended up building it from source. Uh, so this was not documented anywhere, and I had, like, we broke, like, several hours actually figuring stuff like this. Um, so this kind of brings me to what we're going to do uh, 
going forward. So some of us at Mapbox, including Aaron, who is sitting there, um, have been looking at how we can streamline uh, some of these problems, including documentation and making it easy for people to install the software. Um, so part of the motivation is that we've been trying to use set up OpenStreetMap sandboxes for training people and also bringing new people up to speed in mapping, right? Uh, and it's pretty difficult to actually set up a new instance in 15 minutes. Um, this is where we want to get to. Uh, it's, I know this is very ambitious, and in, in all fairness, I do realize that, but if we can start thinking about how we can put this together to actually get to a point where people can take all our software and run with it, that'll be excellent. Um, we're going to do some of the documentation stuff tomorrow at the Hack Day, so come find me or Aaron. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how we can make the existing software uh, better for people to add more features. So there have been ideas like, uh, how do we kind of have a plugin environment so that you know people could just write other features on top of it? Uh, so there are all these ideas. We're going to start. So the first step for me is definitely getting the documentation in place uh, for all the pieces. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be looking into some of that stuff tomorrow. Thanks. I'm okay if you say this is crazy. <laughs> hey. Yeah, hi. Um, I would say one of the difficulties with doing this, because I've, I've done this before, I, I've, I've over many years had um, customers who want OpenStreetMap in a box put together. And I think the big difficulty with the reuse of the existing OpenStreetMap software is that it's quite heavily designed for high volume, high throughput um, things. Like Mod ModTile, for example, works best under heavy load right. with lots of data. So my question to you is, do you think that the best route is to try and join all the existing pieces of software together? Or is it to take some of these um, services and write a simpler version that will work more easily for people. Is there a different rendering stack? What about, is this going to involve nominatum or is there a kind of bare bones uh, geocoder alternative that you could use? Uh, yeah, interesting question. So, so some of, this is something that I've been thinking about as well. Like, does it actually make sense for us to use the exact same software, or does it make sense to borrow this idea and write something new? Um, yes and no, and I haven't actually come up come up with like a solid answer to this because like the software that exists does work and it's proven to work, um, and I'm kind of conflicted with the idea of writing something new to do the same thing. Um, which again, kind of. So then I start thinking about like how, how about we make sure the existing stuff gives like the core features, and you could easily like add some of the new things that you want, or sort of customize things faster. But I don't know really, yeah. But if you if you think if you think it's easy enough to actually like fork or create a new version of Modtile that it's not right. <laughs> Hey, Grant. Yeah. yeah. Hi. So, so I think we really need to give the OpenStreetMap API website a, a better name. So uh, Wikipedia decided to call their piece of software MediaWiki. Right. So they swapped, swapped it around. Because otherwise, if we call the software OpenStreetMap, it causes some confusion. It would be nice to come up with a an interesting name that we could call the software, which would explain it. Right. 
So and this is this is something that I was actually thinking about while writing the title of my talk, and I had this immense difficulty to actually think of naming this thing. Uh, and I also spoke to Alex while we were like kind of I was writing the the outline for the session. I was like, what do we call this? Like this is this is OpenStreetMap, but it's not 100% OpenStreetMap. So if you can think of a name, that's awesome. Well, there's enough people here to come up with a decent yeah. name. <laughs> Yeah, maybe mix some some alcohol in with it. <laughs> we could do that. Yeah, just have all this loading infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I can't quite hear you. Oh, I'm sorry for causing this trouble. Uh, just uh, wanted to add to previous discussion that uh, we don't have any software that is called OpenStreetMap. We have uh, the main piece of software is called the Rails port, and so on. It's not a good name, but still. <laughs> Uh, just, just to kind of repeat the, uh, repeat what the gentleman said is that uh, there's no software called OpenStreetMap. Uh, usually, what we refer to is the Rails port, and he thinks that it's sort of not a nice name. And I agree. Yeah. But like Rails port is only like a small bit of it. There's so much more to the whole system. More questions, thoughts. Okay, good. Um, no, just with this idea of encouraging different instances of the OpenStreetMap software, I know, is there any thought or discussion around sort of having data interoperable between, like, this idea of sort of like being able to merge data between these instances or having these instances talk to each other? Just wondering if there's any work or thoughts or any, um, anything around that. Yeah, so we kind of touched upon this a little bit. Uh, and the buff right after, right before the talk. Uh, so there is a continuous interest of like actually bringing data, keeping data in sync with other instances of OpenStreetMap that people are using. Um, it's extremely difficult to do that, um, especially in cases where people actually have custom presets which do not exist in OpenStreetMap. How are you going to actually add that into OpenStreetMap? Um, and we earlier today we heard that like imports are sort of discouraged, so you don't want to be able to like add, like one click import the whole thing into OpenStreetMap. So yeah, that's also something that we should start thinking about. Uh, there are a lot of people who actually want to contribute data in their system into OpenStreetMap, but it's not easy. Uh, but we know like stuff like MapRoulette and TwoFix could be used in that cases. Hello? Oh, there we go. It works. Um, I am fairly new to this community, uh, but so far what I've felt was that it would be wonderful for OSM to be the master, in a sense, and then for OpenStreetMap software in a box to be like an extra layering system where you would pull in the layers from OSM or possibly from uh, satellite imagery, and then just have an edit editing available for an extra layer of whatever data you're adding, not as like, basically OSM being one of the layers, 
satellite being another layer, and then any instance of OpenStreetMap software, whatever we want to call it, Opsum. Uh, then, oh, that's a good name, Opsum. Um, we'll vote on that. So that would provide an ability to pull other layers in and then add something, and then each whoever installs the Opsum will have the, the will become the master of that layer. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm sort of confused how that's going to work. I, I'm. Uh, the question. I mean, question more. Is this work? Does this work? Okay. It's really confused. Uh, sorry. The question more like uh, more like a comment is that um, can we you can we keep like some layers that is ex exportable from OpenStreetMap and this custom instance of OpenStreetMap could just like have them as a like a tile layer. Uh, so it could be a tile layer and then satellite and then all the edits go into a different database. I don't know how that's going to work. It's sort of. Uh, for different types of data. So you don't have to keep it in sync? OK. Yeah, it's doable. All right. Thanks so much, folks. <laughs>